going on, everybody? I'm Two Tone the Artist. And I'm Mitch the Peach. Welcome back to another episode of The Hills Are Silent Podcast, where we chop it up about the games of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Another week, another round of games, another round of stuff to talk about. So I have been playing some stuff recently, but I'm not quite ready to talk about it. So Mitch, I'm going to shift over to you. Sounds like you got a new game you've been playing. I've never even heard of this, didn't know it existed. It actually looks like it didn't come out that long ago. So that it seems to be a newer game, but still never heard about it before it came out. This is my first time learning about this game. You always know about the exclusives, man. What is this game? That's right. What have you been playing? Yeah, I have been playing, and uh, this one has been, I've been spanning this one as my bedtime game on my Switch for probably quite a few months now, and I'm at the tail end of it. I'm getting close to beating it, but I figured I played enough. I'm ready to talk about it. And this one is called Live Alive. And it's originally a 1994 Japanese RPG that was developed by developed and published by Square Enix for the Super Famicom or Super Nintendo. Uh, it was developed by what once was called Development Division 5 of Square Enix, and uh, which are noted as some of the creators of the Final Fantasy series. Um, it might touch on a little later as we get through the, the division of, uh, or the business structure of uh, Square Enix is a bit wild, but we'll... I'm going to stick to Live Alive for a little bit, and then we can maybe dive into that. Okay. So this is a remake that was published in, uh, on Nintendo Switch in 2022, and then PlayStation and Steam 2023. And it reminds me of a game that I am very... One of my favorite games that I've played in most recent years, Octopath Traveler, which, again, spoilers, I have a good pickup for uh, the pickup section. But this one is uh, a game that follows seven district scenarios scattered across different time periods uh, with basically two or more unlockable scenarios linking the narratives together through a reoccurring antagonist. So essentially, there's seven different chapters, each in different time periods, each have their own different stories, but they're all connected in some way. And when you beat all seven of the chapters, you unlock an eighth chapter, which is set in the Middle Ages, and it ties all those narratives together. Whoa. So, yep, so it's pretty cool. So, like, I'm, for instance, uh, there are a couple of them I liked more than others. You got to just choose which you wanted to start with. There was no order by which uh, time period you wanted to go in. You could just go in the time period from from the beginning of time essentially to the distant future or you could just do them out of order which is kind of what I did but uh, I'm going to name a couple of the ones I did that really stood out to me that I thought was fun there's one I actually just finished up today that was really cool I did one that was called The Distant Future and uh, you're essentially you're in a cargo ship there's a team of you in a cargo ship that's carrying a monster to earth a maintenance robot called Cube ends up investigating the incident while the monster escapes and begins begins killing all of the crew. Um, essentially, which combined in all of that, the, the team is turning on each other because they think one another is the one who is sabotaging this whole this whole thing. And so the ultimate culprit, though, to, sorry for a spoiler, if you do plan on playing this game, spoiler alert, fast forward for maybe 20 seconds. Uh, it turns out the the main culprit is actually the computer of the the spaceship. So the spaceship has its own AI mind, and it's essentially framing all the people inside the ship, all the crew members, into thinking each other did it. Until at the end, you, the cube, who is this little robot, who is the player-controlled character, he's the one who takes out the AI-controlled, you know, ship to. Uh, and it, and it ultimately saves the day, but there were many casualties along the way. Sounds like Hal. You ever seen A Space Odyssey 2001? No, I have not. It's an old movie. I think it came out in the 1970s. A uh, real famous movie. It was directed by Stanley Kubrick. And trippy movie. That guy was, I don't know, he was out there with some of his movies. But anyway, Hal <laughs> was the 
AI Very similar. on the spaceship who eventually becomes uh, homicidal. And there's yeah, so that that's been ahead. like parodied and also spun into so many other stories as well. But anyway, carry on. It reminded me of like Alien vs Predator, or, you know, Predator or something like that, where they're on the on the ship trying to escape. But uh, yeah, so the before going to the other one that really stood out to me, the combat of this really is what like drew me in the art style. So the art style is that new age pixelated graphics as you're probably seeing on the screen right now and the gameplay is that uh it's more of a mix between uh, a turn based but also grid based combat so you're moving your character around a grid and then getting to attack uh, every so often and picking a move and doing the the, the usual japanese turn based rpg mechanics so just out of curiosity mm -hmm. um I just wanted to, well, that's a really tiny screenshot. <laughs> I wanted to look at some of the, the screenshots from the original Super Nintendo version, just as a comparison. Mm -hmm. And, uh, man, they're all so tiny. I don't know why these screenshots are so tiny, but... Anyway, yeah, it definitely looks like a Super Nintendo game. I don't yeah, know I did not play it on game. Super Nintendo back in the day. I did not, but uh, I had, I saw the graphics and I, you know, I looked right at my alley and I'm I'm really digging the new age pixelated remasters and and new games even that are coming to uh, consoles and PC. Really fun. But uh, my second one, I think you'll you'll enjoy this one too, was set in the Wild West, and you are a wandering gunslinger called the Sundown Kid. And you meet up and you meet with this bounty hunter called Mad Dog in this isolated town for a gun duel. You guys are nemesis. You're going to you're going to do a showdown, you know, the typical back to back and then draw kind of thing. Well, while they get there, they start they end up working together to liberate the town from a bunch of crazy bandit gang and essentially defeating that gang was was probably the most fun I had in that game. So while it was all a lot of like exploratory, like not much really combat in that chapter until the end when you're fighting the gang to lead up and while you and the bounty hunter Mad Dog are trying to sabotage the bandits, you are ordering all the town's members so anybody from the bartender to some little kid who gives you a slingshot and they all believe in you. They want you to help them and, and, and take out this crazy gang that's like that's messing with their town. So your job as the main character is to order all the town folk to set traps for these guys. So you collect materials around the town and you bring them back and you order towns members to set up traps. And you have to know that each specific town member sets up traps at different speeds. And you only have a certain amount of time until sun up when the bandits start coming in and the gang starts coming in to take out, take out everybody in the town. With that also being said, there are certain items that you collect while you're going about and collecting that, that are better for certain towns members to use. So there's there's better ways to go about it. There's like the more time effective ways. And basically if you do it all correctly and I kind of, I did it by myself at first and I realized that I did not do it as well. And, and so I, I went back and looked at a guide so I could get the best scenario at the end. But uh, if you had the best scenario, you start taking out these, these gang members one by one, when they roll into town, they're blowing up, they're running into they're running into like string and flying off their horse. They're, you know, some they're getting hit with slingshots. They're, you know, you're dumping like manure on the ground or something, and the horse is slipping on it. And a ton of funny things happen so that at the end, when you have to face the boss fight, because there's a boss fight on every one of these chapters, you have less of those grunts to have to deal with. You only have to deal with maybe one or two grunts and then the main, the main boss. So it was kind of cool that uh you know, it was a time limit. There was a bell that kept going off every time that you'd, you'd set up a trap and you're like, OK, I got this much time left until I get all these traps set. And yeah, that was that was a really cool chapter. 
but yeah, they're they're all very different, but then they connect together. I thought it's really cool. I'm excited to see how that ends. I got one more chapter left, and then uh, and then I'll do the final chapter with all of the with all the characters together. So that will be neat. Uh, definitely gonna finish it. Almost done. I'm gonna push through it. But that is live alive, and yeah. really good. I'd be curious to know how close it sticks to the original game. And just looking at it, it looks like the original game only came out in Japan. So unless okay. there's like a, a fan translation, or if you know Japanese, it'd be, probably be pretty hard to play through it. It's really neat because all of it is voice acted too. Like sometimes, like I know with Octopath Traveler when I played that through, only portions were voice acted and it was like the beginning like of a sentence it's like hey you but then like the rest of it is just text hey you here's but, like five pages of text to read <laughs> yes exactly but live alive like every everything was voice acted that's so that's I wonder, awesome yeah it was i was really impressed by that i like that i know in past episodes we've talked about the importance of reading and video games because it does strengthen your reading skills but yeah man sometimes i just want to be lazy and just Give me all the voice acted lines and just let me listen to them. Exactly. Yeah, and all the voice acting is really well done, so that that helps too. Yeah. Although most of the time anymore, I'm just playing video games late at night, like right before bed, uh, in the bedroom with the fiance, and got the sound off anyway with the subtitles on. So even if there was voice acting, I'd still be forced to read through it all. So I'm not disturbing. Yeah, I feel like sometimes I read faster than they actually talk to, which is like, all right, I'm 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 done listening to you yeah. now. Skip, skip to the next line. <laughs> that happens too. Yeah, if they're actually showing the text on the screen, it's the same time they're playing the, the voiceover. I'm the same way. I'm just like, all right, what's next? Right. Is that what they do in this game where they'll talk and it'll still so, show it? You can do both. Like if I get impatient sometimes and then I like I click it again and then it just shows the whole text for you. So you can let it, you can let it, flow while he talks or you can just click like twice and it'll show the whole text for you (laughs) this looks like a cool game i've never played octopath traveler i've heard it's really good i always thought the art style was really cool and yeah it's very i don't know i don't know what term i want to use for it but it's very whimsical yet also moody especially looking at some of these more big monster bosses yeah there's a lot of serious concepts in it but then like it gets like really funny at times too like their dialogue or like stuff that they do within the within some of the chapters while they're while they're like fighting some serious boss it can still be funny so it's yeah i think it really might have been uh influenced especially since both are square enix uh published games by or from live alive was heavily influenced by Octopath Traveler or vice versa since Live Life came out before. But yeah, so I, I like the whole multiple stories coming together. Yeah, you said it was uh, grid-based combat? It is grid-based combat. It's hard yeah, to tell so with the screenshots because I don't like, there's no grid on the ground, at least in the screenshots. So it's a mix. There's a lot of like ex- exploration within the games too. Like you don't always some some chapters you don't have a lot of fighting like at all and you're doing more like exploratory a lot of dialogue and just kind of going through the story like this distant future one i did i didn't have any combat in the distant future chapter until the very end when i faced off against the ai like bot to destroy him oh wow that's actually pretty awesome because that's the only thing that i'm kind of critical of with RPGs is just sometimes there's just so many battles and so much grinding, especially if it's like, um, what is it, like random battle encounters. So, but that's the thing, like a lot of RPGs have some of the best stories and games. Mm-hmm. So sometimes it's like when they're really grindy, it's like, man, I just got to fight through just never ending random battles just to get through this great story. So it's nice that it sounds like this is more of a laid back game that yes. the story is the bigger focus over the combat definitely uh there are some chapters where they do encourage a little bit of grinding but it's it's nothing compared to like major rpgs where you're you're doing a ton of grinding just to get to the next chapter in the story like you said yeah, uh, so, yeah and then every chapter is different so that, that makes it fun too so when you're playing this on switch 
Are you playing it in handheld mode or docked mode in the bedroom? Handheld mode. Okay. Oh yeah, I, I play night handheld mode probably ninety eight percent of the time on my Switch. Okay. All right. That's, yeah, it's. it's yeah, I find that interesting. It's like, yeah, it's super cool. The Switch is like a hybrid console, but it's not the most powerful console. So you're not going to get the best experience hooking it up to a big screen. It's like a mediocre TV console and an amazing handheld. So it does not surprise me that the majority of the time you're just playing it in handheld mode. Well, I like because I'm usually like laying back in my bed and then like I'll flip on maybe like a, a sporting event or a Twitch stream or something on my TV so I can... You know, have a little background noise while I'm playing my game and just relaxing. So yeah, I like I like the multitask in there. Yeah, I've come across some good deals on a Switch and just never pulled the trigger, but those those ones, the Switch lights that are only handheld, mm-hmm. man, I've I've been in pawn shops and seen those like as cheap as seventy five dollars. Seventy five dollars definitely think it's worth it. I mean as someone who only plays in handheld, I mean, I wouldn't see any downside, really. Yeah, but a part of me is just like, even though that's such a good deal, a part of me is just like, man, I, I would want the actual dockable switch for that two percent of the time I actually want to dock it. Plus, there's been a ton of rumors about them creating a new like next generation switch coming within the next year or so. So at this point. You know, maybe wait wait around for that one. We'll see. Well, you know me, man. I'm always a couple years behind anyway, so well, yeah. I get stuff for. That's that the whole out, purpose. You get <laughs> get it for cheap, you get the man. Last generation one, exactly. Get the get the dockable one. That's you know the current version when the new one comes out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I think that's a good uh, good roll into our next topic. So I know you got some pickups, but yeah. Before we dive into that, I do want to comment on, yeah, there are situations where <clears throat> I've seen good deals like that and I've passed them up for one reason or another. With the Switch situation, even though that's a great deal on a Switch Lite, like I said, I passed it up several times because if I'm going to get a Switch, I'm going to get like the full-blown one. But you and I, we pick up a lot of games. Um and it's great it's fun but as i mentioned in our previous episode you also got to be financially responsible there's just so much amazing stuff out there not just video games just in the world like we live in a consumer driven world we're just all the awesome stuff you could ever imagine is at your fingertips Mm -hmm. and a lot of it is very affordable but a lot of affordable things combined becomes unaffordable so even when good deals come by, sometimes you have to pass them up. And this month, I was going to cut back on buying some games, but obviously the previous episodes, I had some, some pickups, some stuff I couldn't resist. Um, but all that was within reason and within my budget. But man, there was two other good deals that have come my way that I just had to turn down because I just did was not in the budget, man. And one of those is the I don't even know if you've heard of this. The Sony 3D display. No. Are you familiar with this? I am not. Alright, so maybe you recall uh Back in like between 2009 to 2012, 3D was a craze and a, a new a fad all over again because fads always oh, come yeah. back around. And 3D was back in the spotlight because Avatar had just come out and blown everyone's mind. And then all these TV manufacturers were like, "Let's bring 3D to the living room." So all the TV manufacturers were now selling these 3D TVs. They were crazy expensive though. And you'd have to buy the TV and just like at the movie theater, you needed glasses. And there was different, 3D was done in different ways on different TVs, but sometimes the glasses alone could be a couple hundred bucks. 
and you buy a TV and it comes with one pair of glasses. Well, what if you got a whole family in the living room? Next thing you know, you're buying a bunch of pairs of $200 glasses so everybody can enjoy the 3D. And then ultimately it fizzled out. It didn't take off like people thought it would. And even though it was a really cool technology, it just, uh, yeah, people weren't buying into it. I feel like any time like I saw like anything in 3D, there were very, very few moments where the 3D would actually happen. So 75, 80% of the movie, I'm just with these dumb glasses having being all dizzy because I don't feel good in them for those 25% where you actually get to see something like in uh, Jackass, the movie, when one of those jackasses is in 3D and you got to see him blast off from a porta potty or something. Like, I don't know. It, it it was very, very few and far between of the, the moments that I felt was worth the extra money and the time wearing those glasses. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. It, it could be uncomfortable. And I think that around the time the TV manufacturers were finally getting the technology to where it needed to be, to where 3D was actually comfortable for people, people had already lost interest at that point. Uh, anyway, I always had a passing interest in it. I do like going to 3D movies even to this day. Usually if a movie's out in theaters and there's a 3D version, that's the one I wanna go see. But you're right, sometimes it can give you a freaking headache. Um, but I'll fight through it because sometimes the moments are really cool. So anyway, back in 2011, I believe, when this TV came out, it is a Sony PlayStation branded 3D television. And at the time, the PlayStation 3, they were releasing some 3D games for the PS3. Same thing with the Xbox 360, which I didn't know. I knew that. I had bought in PlayStation 3 games that said 3D compatible on it, but I had no idea that some 360 games were also 3D compatible. Uh, anyway, when this TV first came out, it's a small TV. It's only 24 inches, so it's almost more like a computer monitor. It first retailed for $500. And uh, I always said if I could pick one up for a good deal, I'd get it. Because I do have a lot of PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 games that are 3D. Right. You can also use it as a computer monitor, and there's plenty of software out there that can actually make, like, basically all your play, your PC games 3D. So wow. it would be cool to have something like this to where I could just dabble in my curiosity for 3D games. And a listing came up on eBay, and it was less than $200 and it came with everything. Sometimes it's hard to find these with the glasses or with all the, the parts to it, but it was a complete thing and it was less than 200 bucks. I thought about picking it up and ultimately I passed because man, even though that's a sweet deal, it's like, I don't really need this 3D TV. It's prob the more I thought about it, I'm like, it's probably not that great. I'm not gonna play that many 3D games on it because it's probably gonna give me a headache and the glasses you wear are dark, so you're you're basically playing video games with sunglasses on. And I'm like, that's that's not comfortable. It's not it's not something I would sit down and play for hours and hours. Uh, so anyway, I let it slide this time, and I found out that these TVs are prone to failure. Oh. There's an EE Prom chip inside of them that is almost guaranteed to go bad in every single model of this TV. So if I were to buy one of these and it's working and that EE prom chip has not already been replaced, I would have to hunt that down, take this thing apart and replace it. Otherwise the TV is just a ticking time bomb. So. Sure. So yeah, I don't know, man. Did you know anybody that had a 3D TV back when that was a fad? No, I don't think so. I feel like I remember seeing maybe commercials on it or like lightly advertised, but no, I I definitely didn't play on one. And uh, yeah, I can't think of anybody at school who bragged about having one or anything either. Yeah, I just don't think anybody bought them. And but yeah, I, the only time I ever saw them was like the floor model at Best Buy, and then half the time somebody had broken the glasses, so you couldn't even check it out anyway. 
<laughs> oh man I can't stand people like going to stores and just like like are you that destructive that you can't walk through a best buy without without destroying something that's put out on display like what is with people man same thing with arcades it's like there's just tons of people who will come by and just use an arcade game like it's supposed to and then you get that one kid or grown adult who comes in and they're just like a bull in a china shop and everything they touch they break I mean, we have talked about on a past pod about people in there have their own things that they own and how destructive they are with their scratching up their discs, destroying their Guitar Hero controllers, yeah. you know, even rolling their consoles down a flight of stairs. Like it, you know, people just don't care. Yeah, especially if it's not theirs. Yes. Even more that, so if it's not theirs. They, they absolutely give, give a crap less. Um, Anyway, the last thing I'm going to say on this TV is it it would be cool to have one and check out the 3D, but one of the other selling points of this TV was, I believe, called Sim, Simul Vision, or I don't even know if I'm pronouncing it right, or Simul Vision. Simul? Yeah, yeah, Simul Vision. Yeah, Simul Vision. So basically, how that would work is two players can play co-op on the same screen without split screen whoa so each player would wear their glasses and it's it's flashing each image so quickly and they're in sync with the glasses that when you're looking at it through your glasses you're seeing the whole tv is your screen and then the other person playing is seeing the whole tv is their screen which is a pretty cool concept yeah I would have loved that in my Halo days. Uh, yeah. Or make it a friend do it so that it can't screen peek on me. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, that goes back to what I was saying earlier. This TV only comes with one pair of glasses. So you'd have to hunt down another pair of the glasses and then really only like three games supported that. So. Oh, well. <laughs> so it was a novelty at best because it didn't really catch on. But anyway. Um, one more thing. One more deal I had to pass up. So shout out to my buddy Evan. Uh, I know he listens to the podcast sometimes. And he knows I love video games. He knows I collect games. And recently he was getting rid of some of his old stuff. And he was kind enough to reach out to me and be like, Hey man, I got some old, old games and consoles from my childhood. I'm looking to get rid of. I know you play video games and collect games. Are you interested in, in any of it? So, yeah, he sent me the whole list of what he had, and uh, a lot of it was things I already owned, but he did have some some cool stuff in there, and uh, he offered me a wicked deal on some of the stuff, but I was just like, man, uh, it's just one of those situations, I was like, ah, uh, it's such a good deal, I want this stuff, but at the same time, if, if you don't have the money for it, if it's not in your budget, you gotta fight it, man, you gotta say no. Gotta let it go. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, Evan, if you're listening, appreciate that, man. Hopefully you'll find somebody that will buy that stuff off of you and give it a good home, play those games, and appreciate the stuff. Yeah, definitely. But you came across a, an amazing, amazing deal. What did you find? I did, yeah. I, I sent it to you today. I was, I was looking. I have actually ordered something off eBay, and I was just browsing while I was checking my order status. And I saw a great deal on a PlayStation VR complete PlayStation, PlayStation 4 VR, VR, right? PlayStation 4 VR, excuse me. Yeah. The whole experience, though. So, I mean, you were you're the expert. So you you pointed me and you said, yo, this is a great deal. It's about, I think, one hundred and thirty dollars. I remember you saying that you paid like thirty dollars for just that light gun. Uh this came with both the obviously the headsets it came with the the camera the the gun and you told me those two uh what the they move call controllers con PlayStation move, move controllers. controllers yeah two yeah. move controllers for a total of 130 dollars and you were saying those move controllers could go from what 60 to 75 bucks a p or like uh together yeah yeah even those are expensive um uh, yeah that's a crazy deal and again it just goes to show like Sometimes there's just that sweet spot in time where nobody is looking for something 
and nobody's buying it. So you can just get these amazing deals. And yeah, a complete VR experience, a good one, mind you, because the PlayStation VR is a great, uh, yeah. great setup. For 130 bucks, the headset, the camera, both of the move controllers, and the um, the sharpshooter. Oh, done, but I don't even. Yeah, sure. <laughs> That's crazy, man. Because yeah, those move controllers, they're like anywhere from 30 to 50 bucks a piece on their own, and then yeah, that sharpshooter goes for like 50 bucks. So crazy, crazy good deal. The only only caveat to that is what I mentioned to you is that there's actually two models of the PlayStation 4 VR headset. There is the first one that originally came out, and then there was a later revision. And it, it's it's a very, very minor upgrade, but I would tend to tell people to get the second model. And what the big difference is, is that with the original model, it's if I remember correctly, it's two cords that come out of the headset. And it's mm-hmm. kind of he- and they're heavy cords, and then in the later revision they streamlined it to just one cord that's much lighter, so it feels yeah. lighter on your yeah. head because you don't have so many cords coming out of the the helmet. It's just kind of a cleaner setup, and also the second revision has the headphones built into the the headset, so you're not okay. gonna like lose them or anything. It's just they're built into it. But other than that, I mean those very minor improvements, but. It is a slightly better, better one to get the revision. But for that that crazy deal, man, I would, I would, I would still get it, man. I know it, it's it was very tempting, I, as I told you. But I weighed the pros and cons and how much money I have been spending lately, as we've talked about, on a new TV and a laptop and games that I've gotten. Uh, you know, I gotta dial it back. You know, it's just I gotta dial it back, and that's okay. You know. I, I, the only reason I was looking because you were saying you found all these good deals and I just want to tell the audience that Mike is not lying. There are some really good deals in that PlayStation 4 VR. So if you are interested, as he said, I can vouch. Now's the time. Go ahead and get your entry into the VR space. Yeah, but also it's just a reminder that whatever is the hottest, newest VR headset right now, a couple of years from now, it's going to be nobody's gonna want it except people like me and it's gonna be dirt cheap so just just keep that in mind it's like sometimes it pays to be patient and in a space like vr in a space like vr i mean while there are like they're upgrading they're you know they're making things lighter you know more durable better you know performance everything like that I don't think the jump from headset to headset is as big at this point to warrant you needing to have the latest and greatest. I think, you know, if you go back a couple a couple generations or a couple models back of, uh, of headsets, you're still going to get a really good experience. And I agree with that because the first time I ever tried VR, well, that's not true. The first time I tried VR, I think, was in the 90s, but that was a whole... <laughs> whole different VR experience and how amazing it is today. But the first time I tried modern VR back in 2017, I think it was the, I don't know, like the, the first model, the HTC Vive. Mm-hmm. And it blew my mind. And it was an incredible experience. And, and like you said, like the core experience of VR has not drastically changed from model to model. So even that that was amazing in 2017. That same headset is still amazing um, six years later in 2023. So, you know, VR is VR, man. It's it's only going to get better, but at the same time, uh, the foundation is good, even on the older yeah. headsets. Absolutely. Yeah, but yeah, you got other stuff to worry about right now, and uh, when you are ready to buy a vr headset you'll get an even better one for probably that exact same price yeah i'll i'll get into it eventually i I, i've been hesitant to get into it but i I think you've really sold me on it so eventually i i will dive in yeah but you did pick up some stuff though recently though didn't you i did pick up some stuff yes uh a, a little less than the the price i would pay for the headset but while that is a really good deal not not too much less uh 
So yeah, I've picked up. Uh, we're we're staying on the Square Enix theme of the uh, of the episode today because I've picked up two more games that are published by Square Enix, and my first one that we I was hinting at earlier is Octopath Traveler Two. Nice for the PS4. Unfortunately, with Octopath Traveler One, I got to play that one all the way through on Game Pass. But for right now, Octopath Traveler 2 is only on Nintendo Switch, PC, PS4. I bet Sony did some sweetener of a deal or something to say, hey, don't put that on Xbox. They've been a little bit, you know, a little bit snaky lately trying to trying to slide Xbox on some good Japanese RPGs. And this has been one of my my new favorite franchises in uh, Octopath Traveler, so it wait kind of a so, bummer. So the second, the first one came out on Xbox. First one came out on Xbox, yes. So the second one, it it didn't come out on Xbox or it didn't come out on Game Pass. Both did not okay. come out on Xbox. Period. Right. That's what I thought you meant, huh? Yeah, uh, my bad. I wasn't very clear on that, but yeah, didn't come out on Xbox at all, which I think is weird. I wonder if it's maybe a time thing, and maybe yeah, maybe it'll come out later. But I, I found this deal, and I, I have a PS4 Pro, so I figured, you know, I, now is the time. I I found, I, was, I sent you a link on it. It was a buy one, get one free on Amazon, and as an Amazon Prime with a membership, I thought it was a really good deal because I didn't have to, you know, overload my cart for the free shipping. It doesn't matter how much I pay for it. So I ended up getting Octopath Traveler, which is a lot like the game we talked about earlier in Live Alive, as I mentioned. It's a it's a, it's a Japanese RPG de- developed by Square Enix and Acquire, and then published by Square Enix. It's the sequel to Octopath Traveler, which came out in 2018. It's actually the third entry in the series, which I didn't know. The very first what? Octopath Traveler called Champions of continent was a mobile game that came out uh in 2022 it's a prequel i guess so i guess they call it the third installments but uh i don't know i mean mobile games have come a long way but not sure i'm gonna dive into that one ever yeah so question i see you got it on playstation 4 was did you think about getting it on Switch instead, or was that not was that not part of the sale? If it was part of the sale, would you have gotten the Switch, or did you clearly have the intention of getting the PlayStation 4 version? Yeah, I would have been fine getting it on the Switch. I think I was looking at the prices, though, and it was cheaper to get the PS4 version over the Switch version with the buy one, get one. Oh, A lot of times, like we've talked about, yeah, with Nintendo... <laughs> the Switch tax... Exactly. Just just for it being a Nintendo product, even though it's on other platforms, it's a little bit of a higher price sometimes. I and that think Switch, that was the case with this one. Mm, that Switch premium, premium Switch price, that Switch tax gets you every time. Well, the, the funny thing is it probably runs worse than it does on yeah. the PS4. I mean, yeah, so. really the PS4 is going to be the, the better version to get, unless you're like so, so planning on playing it in a handheld mode. Right, and knowing me, I would be playing in handheld mode if I did play it on my Switch. So I figured I'd go with the PS4 version for the cheaper price, and then, you know, it's probably a more powerful place to play it. Yeah. But yeah, with uh, with both Octopath Traveler 1 and then 2, it has the same structure of you follow eight separate character stories throughout the game. This time it's a whole new set of eight characters uh, that are completely separate from the first game in a different area uh, of the world. So uh, pretty excited to dive into Octopath Traveler 2. I may move it really far up my backlog just because I, I was obsessed with the first one. It's gonna be a long one though. I, I, I know it's always, these these ones are pretty long. Live Alive, I, I'm almost done with that one and that was like probably 20, 20 hours though. So not too bad for a Japanese no, RPG, that's, right? No, that's a sweet spot, man. That's, that's the one I would play, 20 hour one. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, that's Octopath Traveler, and the other one I got is also a Square Enix game, and it is called The Diofield Chronicle. This is one that I got it on Xbox, and I'm going to get it on a console that is either PlayStation or Xbox. I always lean toward Xbox. Okay. I uh, I love the getting the achievements on Xbox. I have over 140,000, as we have discussed on a previous pod, so... 
And plus, I have the Xbox Series X, which I think just runs everything like butter, and it's yeah. fantastic. So Before is this, I, this one a... Uh, oh, yeah, it says real-time tactical battle. So this is not a turn-based one or a grid-based RPG. This is actually... Yes. Yeah, they call it a strategy role-playing game. It's very much... I think they were saying it has a lot of, uh, of XCOM-like similarities to it. Oh, yeah, I see. I'm watching the footage with, of it now. Interesting. With some, like... It looked like you're, like, drawing around the map. Yeah. Like, it's showing your, like, your character where to go, which I thought was, was pretty neat. Hmm. It's got mixed reviews on Steam. I, th I have read them, and it's kind of a love it, you love it or you don't kind of thing. So there are plenty of people who, who have put in the hours and enjoyed it. My favorite Steam reviews, though, that we always make fun of are the people that are like, I put 50 hours into this, didn't enjoy it. It's like, <laughs> I know. I'm like, are you insane? Why would you dump 50 hours into a game you didn't enjoy? Just yeah, so they can write the heck, this review man. and show that he had 50 hours played. <laughs> that Yeah, that always baffles my mind. I'm like, obviously you did enjoy it, because you sat there and played it for 50 freaking hours. Yeah, and I want to say in general, too, the Dial Field Chronicle is a really cool name for a video game. I don't yeah. know. I've, I don't even know what that means, but it sounds really cool. But uh, yeah, that's that was my other pickup. I got, I got an Amazon buy one get one free. I think I pay with a total with tax maybe thirty five dollars for the nice. two of them. Which you know, they're two very recent games. Uh, Octopath Traveler two came out in twenty twenty two, I believe, and then Dialfield Chronicle. I it says Octopath Traveler two came out in February of this year. So the Switch version came out in 2022, oh, and okay. then uh, the PS4 Steam version came out in 2023. Oh, okay. So yes, actually, this is the is newer than the Switch version. Got it. I, see, I yeah, also I noticed that as a theme came out pretty with Square cool. Enix. Like most of the games we covered today, it sounds like they were released earlier on uh, on Switch, and then ported to everything else at a later date. Yeah, which is it's fine. I mean, I'm I have a Switch, but I usually tend to wait on games that are multi-platform to play them on other consoles, just because I have enough Nintendo exclusives to play on my Switch, and I kind of rather get something that runs. I want it to run better on a lot of these multi-platform ones. Yeah, man. I, if I had a Switch, I would, I would do the same thing. Like the Switch would be for those exclusives, but anything that's multi-platform. I'd much rather play it on a more powerful console. Exactly, because the last two Switch games I got are Switch exclusive games. Like I can't play them anywhere else. So it's you know I. That's kind of my my way of looking at it too. Yeah. Cool man, good pickups, um, good deal. Didn't break yeah. the bank. That's the nope. best deal, man. Yeah, it was too good of one to pass up. I had uh, Octopath Traveler 2 on my Steam wish list for a long time, and then Dialfield Chronicle was on my Xbox wish list, so it just made sense, you know? Yeah. All right, man. Do we want to cover the other stuff we have on Square Enix, or do you want to move into our last topic? Uh, what do you think? I think we're okay just moving to the last topic. What time are we at? I think so, too. I think just to just to put a bow on it, I'll I'll quickly say that uh, look it up yourself. There's a good Reddit article if you just if you just type in Square Enix development structure, they have a very strange structure from the start, and then they restructured in 2019 to something even you know just as strange. So uh, I'll I'll give you a little uh, a little tease there. Definitely go and uh, do your own research. Can't find any good articles on it, but I think it's it it's worth uh, looking up in your own time. Yeah, I mean maybe boring to some people but i'm always fascinated about how businesses operate and how they're structured yeah um yeah it's just uh the weirdness of humanity how we we clump together into organizations and then how that molds into a, a working uh mutual relationship amongst people to to make games or whatever it is yeah exactly but i mean it works for square enix because they develop and publish Wonderful games. That yeah, they're, I buy they're all the time. Their level of quality is up there, and they crank games out. So it it must be working. Yeah. 
they take chances to pub publishing and partner with a lot of a lot of random games. Obviously, I am the king of finding random games and playing them, but you know, it seems like if it has their stamp of approval, I enjoy it. Yeah. So the last thing we want to cover is Resident Evil Death Island. So several computer animated Resident Evil movies have been released over the years and I've watched them all. They are all worth a watch. Are they amazing? No. But the the computer animation, like the graphics are usually pretty good in them. Agreed. And there's usually great action sequences. Uh, the only thing is is they're a little light on the horror aspect. I think they they're more they more take after like Resident Evil 4, 5 and 6 than any of the just older say that. older more horror themed ones or more recent horror themed ones. So they're more like action movies than horror movies. But I think this I want to say this is like the fourth one they've come out with. Um, and this one was just recently released. And I watched it. I would say it's on on par with the other ones they've released. It is entertaining. It's cheesy. It is action packed, and uh, it's got all your favorite Resident Evil characters in it, brought together to work as a team. Mm -hmm. But it, I, in my mind, I think it was unintentionally hilarious. Because just like the video games, they end the movie with a big boss battle. And they're in this, uh, I don't know what you'd even call it, like a... A military... Well, they're in, they're in Alcatraz. The movie takes place on that, the Alcatraz. Yeah, that I'm just trying to think island. of like the, the section of <laughs> yeah. where they're... Anyway, bunker, when, not a bunker, when, when they're fighting the ahead. final boss, they're in some little area and they just so happen to have every weapon they could ever need to fight this thing at their fingertips. And I was like, this is so video gamey because at first they're like fighting this giant monster with the pistol. And then I go, how are they going to take this down with the pistol? And then all of a sudden they're like, oh, we found these these M16 assault rifles. And then they're like, oh, we found these RPGs and these rocket launchers and grenade launchers. And oh, I found this Hummer with a mounted machine gun. And then they make it even crazier. Jill is like, oh, I found this. What was it like a a plasma like a rifle? Giant plasma. Yeah. A giant yeah. plasma rifle. Oh, I found this giant plasma rifle behind these boxes over here. Maybe we could use this. And at that point, my mind was just like, like, what? Are you kidding me? Um, in their defense, they did explain it earlier in the movie by going by walking through that same area that they eventually fight the boss. And they go, oh, it looks like they've, they're using this as an armory to store all these weapons. And uh, they just say it real, real, real slyly real in passing. It's like... Just so they can set it up and give some excuse why they have every weapon they need to fight this giant monster at the end, but that was hilarious to me. Yeah, that was pretty funny. That that gun reminded me of the finale of uh, Resident Evil Three, where she's, you know, the blasting nemesis or crazy looking nemesis with whatever plasma rifle she had then. Oh my gosh. Anyway, what is what are your thoughts on this? Have you seen the other? computer animated Resident Evil movies? Yes, I've seen them all because I always get, you know, it's it's a Resident Evil property. I always want to give it a try, even if, you know, the track record with them is, isn't always the greatest. I, I have always enjoyed watching them. I really like those animation style, like you said, though. I, I think the animation style that they chose is really cool. I just wish, kind of like you said, they would go more toward a, the horror aspect, though. I really think that, you know, that would thrive in that area. Like, I understand, like bringing all the characters, bringing every Resident Evil character together and doing this big action sequence is, is really cool and, like, you know, really good for television. But I don't know. I feel like we've seen it. At, at, we see Resident Evil is at its best when it goes to its horror roots. And why not take that in their animated uh, movie property or uh, section as well? Yeah. I wish more properties would go, like, toward that. I mean... 
I feel like a lot of like the even their movies, like they're like they're actual like live action movies that they used to like that were very, very loosely tied to the actual Resident Evil universe. Yeah, very loosely. Yeah, I feel like th- even those should have just gone more of like horror aspect from the beginning. But I guess people like those those Resident Evil movies. I know my buddy Daryl is a big fan of them. So I guess they appeal to enough that they've had many sequels of those. Yeah, I much prefer these CGI ones because they're they're way closer to the game than those live action ones were. Yeah, uh, I, I will say I'm curious because the production value on these movies is top notch. Like, yeah, the animation and the work that that goes into this, it just looks like this just took so much time and effort to make. It's so impressive. So I I would love to see like a making of for these CGI uh, Resident Evil movies. And I'd also like to know how much it cost to make them. Like, what was the production cost? Because obviously they must be turning a profit because, I mean, this is like the fourth one that they've made. But they're all like straight to video. None of them are in theaters. So, yeah, I wonder how much does it really cost to make one of these? And then what are they making on it? I know Netflix got a couple of them, too. Like, yeah. Yeah, that's... So just just real quick, I found this nice list of all the the animated movies in order. And number seven in the year 2000 is Biohazard 4D Executor, which is one I told told you about that was only released in th- in theme parks as a 4D oh, movie. Yeah. And somebody managed to get like a low quality copy of it and upload it on YouTube. It's just a short film. I think it's like. 12 or 14 minutes long and it's actually really creepy and it's got that early 2000s uh cgi which i think is really neat so biohazard 4d executor i recommend that to to anybody to check out on youtube then the next one is biohazard 4 incubate and i don't know if i've ever seen this but it looks like another uh it says it mixes together the cut scenes and gameplay from Resident Evil 4 and the short Ada Wong Separate Ways campaign to make a complete 90 minute long animation movie. I never heard of that. I did not did not know that was released and it almost sounds like that was a fan made thing. So maybe that's not like an official movie, but it says it came out in 2006. Hmm. Uh, but anyway, yeah, the first like real big budget one was Resident Evil Degeneration which came out in 2008. Then there was Damnation, which came out in 2012. And uh, yeah, that had a really cool battle scene between a a tyrant or a Mr. X or whatever it was, and then a bunch of lickers fighting each other. That was a cool scene. And then Vendetta came out in 2017. I remember watching that one. That had a cool boss battle at the end. And then... Yeah, Infinite Darkness is this came out in 2021, and that's the series that Netflix came out with. And I have not finished yep. that. I need to finish that. I don't think it was very many episodes. I want to say it was only like five or less. Yeah, and I only, I only watched the first two. I might as well just knock that out and finish it. And then, of course, there's Death Island, which came out this year, 2023, and that's the one we've been discussing. But cool stuff, man. Yeah, I mean, I love seeing all those characters, especially as I've cranked through all these games recently. It's nice to see them in other in other ways because I'm I'm getting close to beating every Resident Evil at this point. So it's like it's going to be a sad day where I'm like going to be sitting here craving new Resident Evil. Yeah, that's when you go through and you play them all over again, and hopefully you've forgotten enough about them to where it's a fresh experience all over again. Love that. Yep. All right, man. I think that's everything we wanted to cover. We can go ahead and call it. Uh, Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Thanks even more if you made it to the end of the episode, which you can find all of our episodes on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. You can also check us out on our other social media platforms. Mitch, let them know. Our Twitter, at The Hills Are Silent. Our Instagram is Instagram backslash Hills Are Silent. Our TikTok is at The Hills Are Silent. 
podcast. Our YouTube, again, is At The Hills Are Silent. If you have any questions, comments, game recommendations, why don't you tell us about a time where you found a deal and you passed it up because your budget was too tight? You know, we all respect a good budget. Anyway, we'll catch you in the next episode.